Oh, good. <laughs> wow. Wow. Your school teacher background. Right? Okay. <laughs> so um, I am Susan Wingraff. I'm council member representing District 6. And uh, that... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> District 6 is um, the east side of Spruce all the way up to Tilden and the north side of Hearst all the way up to um, uh, the, the reservoir and close to Kensington. It's a very large geographic uh, area and it is in the very high hazard fire zone. Um, with me tonight, co-hosting this event tonight, is Councilmember Drosty, uh, who represents District 8. The District 8 got the brunt of the 1991 wildfire, unfortunately. Um, and also with us tonight is Council Member Sophie Hahn, representing <laughs> District 5. So I want to tell you a little bit um, about uh, how the evening's going to go. I want to thank you all for attending. And um, I want to give a shout out to my assistant, Lori McWater, who is actually pouring water right now. <laughs> there is Lori over there. She really managed this whole event. And Sophie, do you want to thank your, your people? Yes, Brandon Norris from my office, who has helped her. And they've, they've been here running around, putting the chairs together, and all these signs up and things. So thank you to both of them. And my legislative aide, Carrie Birnbach, in the back there. Thank you very much. Okay, so what we're going to do tonight is uh, we have multiple presentations. Uh, first, we're going to have a presentation from Jennifer DeGraff from Rescape, California, on firescaping. Uh, then we're going to have a presentation from our fire department, from Chief Dave Brannigan on the progress that the fire department is making on evacuation routes. I know that that's something that you're all very interested in. And then we have representatives from East Bay Regional Parks. Actually, we have the fire chief, um, Aileen, let's see if I can get this right, Aileen Taylor. Yes, almost? <laughs> um, She's going to talk about the um, protocol, new protocols at the parks um, for vegetation management. And we have a big team here from PG&E. They're in the back corner. Um, we have uh, Treva Reed, who's uh, in charge of public affairs. Um, Matt Pender, who's director of vegetation management. Um, Vitaly Tuturin, who is customer care division leadership, and Pamela Perdue, who's public safety specialist. So we have a, a, a really great representation from PG&E. <laughs> On your seat, there were a couple of things for you to read and do. There were question cards and pencils, and we will be collecting those throughout the evening we're asking you to check off the box of your topic so that we can sort everything out. Uh, and that way, we will have a smoother question and answer period. There's a wildfire evacuation questionnaire, which the fire department would very much appreciate your filling out and returning. And there's a, a box on the table over there for you to return them. Um, there's a household evacuation plan document to plan for you and your family. And there's an undergrounding information flyer. Now, I want to say that over here at the table uh, in the back, uh, we have representatives from an organization. What, Marvin, tell me the name of your organization. OK. And you can sign up over there to become part of their mailing list. They are organizing neighborhoods throughout the city uh, to educate them about undergrounding, its benefits, its costs, and all of that.
Okay, Marvin, we, we, we need to move on. We need, I just want, I'm going to announce the meeting. It's September 27th. If you're on my mailing list or we'll Lori Droste's or Sophie Hans, you will get notification of the meeting. Okay, thank you, Marvin. <laughs> okay, also, also at the side of the room um, are the Path Wanderers. The Path Wanderers have been working tirelessly to create paths that can be used as evacuation routes uh, in the event of a wildfire. They've been clearing them, maintaining them, adding uh, handrails, and uh, we now have a pilot that just got funded for solar lighting uh, on, on some, and hopefully that program will, will grow because as, you, as many of you know, some of them can be quite treacherous at night. So uh, on the side, we have maps of all of the paths in Berkeley. And um, that's something that you should probably familiarize yourself with. And so the maps are available at the side of the room. Yeah. Okay, also, very important. We have computers set up in the back of the room for you to sign up for AC alert and Nixel alerts. Okay, AC alert, there they are. They're waving their hands, waiting for you to come by. Uh, yes, even during the meeting, just get up and go over there and sign up. Um, this is the alert system. AC alert is the alert system in the county that will alert you of any uh, disaster. And if you need to evacuate, AC alert will alert you. You can get it on your computer, you can get it on your phone, you can get it on your landline. I get them on all three. And um, it's, it's really important that you get hooked into that. Nixel, uh, the Nixel alert is more specific to crime. Um, and I, I urge you to, um, to sign up for that as well. AC is Alameda County. Okay. Now I just want to say uh, a little bit about some community successes. Um, I've been working very closely with people who are very concerned about fire and public safety uh, in Berkeley for a long time. And we realized that there were a lot of hydrants that were covered with vegetation, that were um, inaccessible, people were parking in front of them. Uh, paying no attention to them. And so um, we did this little community thing saying, hey, if you're out walking your dog or just walking and you see a hydrant that needs some attention, please let us know. And also, you know those blue reflective markers in the street? Those blue markers tell the fire department where the hydrants are. And so at night, even in the fog, or if there are very smoky conditions, they will be able to locate the hydrants. So people started sending in this, you know, take a photograph with your phone and look at this hydrant. It's completely obscured by vegetation. And this hydrant doesn't have a blue reflector. Well, the Department of Public Works, the director, Phil Harrington, got on it and suddenly the blue reflectors were all installed in the streets. It's wonderful. So as you walk around, I'm going to ask you, if you notice that there's a hydrant without a companion blue reflector, please let one of us know, and we will call it into Public Works and have it installed. That can save time. Um, if you see a fire hydrant where there's vegetation obstructing access, please let us know. We're going to depend on you to inform us because there's, there's no way we can, we can see it all. Um, so thank you for all of those who, who um, let us know about the others. Um, and um, the, the whole purpose of tonight is to try to empower you to do something about your property. Um, you know, we, we know that well, the whole state right now is on fire, frankly, and it's only July. You know, usually we see this kind of activity in September and October. 
fires, it looks like this is, this is the name of the game. They're gonna get worse uh, and they're gonna become more frequent and um, we're gonna lose more structures and more life um, and it's time for us to really get serious about taking care of our own property. So um, we invited Jennifer. Jennifer, you ready? Where are you? Okay, great. So we invited Jennifer. Jennifer is an expert on fire safe scaping to come and do a presentation for you. We're hoping that you will get some ideas and go home and rethink your yards um, and help to make us all safer. So thank you. Nothing like a little two-fisted um, technology there. Hi, okay, so I'm Jennifer. Let me just start by telling you how in the world I ended up here. Um, last summer, my boss at Rescape said, let's do some talks, what do you wanna do? And I said, well, uh, I was here in the fire in Oakland back in the early 90s. That's kind of important, let's do that. So we studied during the summer last year, and I delivered the first version of this talk. Excuse me, my throat isn't gonna comply. The first version of this talk a month before the North Bay fires hit. And it was just like, holy cow, now what do we do? But the really wonderful silver lining of having made that fortuitous decision, and then having that hideous event happen is that it put people like me, ordinary landscape architects and educators, in contact with people like those wearing badges and doing spire science and studies on sparks and how they fly around with the wind and how far they can go. I don't think I ever would have had that kind of contact, not to mention the education you get through NPR and the newspapers and everything else, if it hadn't been for just the timing of that talk and then the timing of the fires. And I feel like I haven't stopped talking about it since. So what I'm gonna do here is a fairly quick, kind of high altitude overview of what I understand of firescaping. If I do something stupid, I want the people wearing badges and the people in the know to tell me um, because I don't want you guys to get anything that's in error, okay? It's very humbling to be in the room with people who studied this formally. So I'm going to do my very best to do that justice. So that's me. You can email me there. You can find me by Googling that spelling. Um, I'm about the only one in the area that's named that, so it's not that hard. And I want to start with the bay-friendly wheel of fortune, so to speak. This is our seven principles for making a design or a landscape maintenance decision about whether or not it's more or less environmentally friendly. Is anyone familiar with Bay Friendly? Yeah, awesome, okay. So I teach that stuff. And those principles are really important for us to understand sustainability as a whole. What I was surprised by, and that's embarrassing now, is that the more I get into the firescaping world, the fire and landscaping put together kind of universe, the more it goes back to the Bay Friendly principles. And that's, that's so cool, but I can't believe I thought it was unexpected. So I won't go into that, because I only have a few, like about a minute, maybe less for every slide. We'll see how this goes. So fire safe is a term I really don't like. I don't think fire is safe. It's not meant to be safe. It wasn't designed to be safe. And I don't think anyone should ever think, I'm just safe. I'm good. It's like calling it deer proof. And those of us in this area know there ain't nothing that's deer proof except maybe daffodils. And that depends on their mood. Um, so. We've got this wonderful Mediterranean climate. We have this really long growing season. We can grow all kinds of stuff from all over the world, all year round. 
and then we get just enough water to keep it going, and then we give it water to keep it going. So we kind of have the perfect conditions for growing a lot of fuel. And fuel is just really anything out there that will burn, which is pretty much everything. And so obviously, I know this is in the news a lot with climate change and global warming and all that stuff. The cycles of our weather, the cycles of our fire, the cycles of our drought are getting more intense, more crazy, and more unexpected. And now, I live just south of y'all in Oakland in a high severity fire zone. And my notices, the notifications in the mail say, there is no fire season. So I keep hearing that term. I know it's sometimes dry in the winter, and it, there's nothing there about it being December that fire goes, oh, sorry, wrong calendar year, here, one month. So that's, that's something we gotta be aware of all the time. And as I go through the rest of these, I want you to think about where you live and how do you see in your own home and garden, or if you're thinking about another structure, an office maybe, um, I want you to think about how do you get off that property? Where are the higher risks coming to that location? And not only how do you get off of that property, but what are your ways out? And I wanna say, my thinking in doing these talks has really revolutionized the way I look at my own yard. I moved into this house maybe five years ago, and I thought, yeah, it's a yard, it's great, it's whatever. There's like no way to get out. <laughs> there's, there's fence all the way around, and if I was to leave my property, if I get off my property in the event of a fire, the best way out of the neighborhood is towards the higher risks where I am, because it would be going towards the freeway, and it would be going downhill, and there's only one route out. If I take the other route, I'm going uphill. I'm going the same direction as the fire, and I may just have my heels being chased by it on my way to I don't even know where else, because everywhere else, there's just more fuel up, uphill from me. So think about where you are as we go through this. Okay, first, before you go doing anything crazy, check your local ordinances wherever you are. Find out who's in charge of permitting processes, uh, drawing review, whatever it is. Get educated by those in your area because it's their rules that count, not something in a book or an article or whatever. Make sure you go local. Know if you're you know, at the Berkeley City, Berkeley Fire Department, I'm assuming everyone in this room is, so I mentioned those. But if you happen to be here from someplace else, make sure you know who you need to talk to to make any changes. And then this is what I want for me, right? I don't know where this photo came from. I haven't been able to identify it. Um, but I want my happy little home to be out in the middle and the one thing that's untouched. Um, but I, as much as we love to look at this photo, and there are not very many photos like this, um, it's, it's, it gives that idea that your landscaping can fix it, can somehow magically correct a fire, and a fire will just go, oh, sorry, you did your firescaping right, and I'll just go on my merry way someplace else. Fire doesn't respect this. This is some kind of weird honking fluke. I don't know how this happened. Maybe someone was there to defend it. Maybe the winds changed. Maybe it ran out of fuel. I couldn't tell you, because that's not my job. But I do want to make you aware that this is what everybody wants. And the fires that we get, they don't always respect this like a photo might, might give you the sense that it could. Does that make sense? It's a terrible sense. Okay, so one thing I want you to know, firescaping isn't a style. We're not trying to take away your creative expression in the landscape. We're not trying to make you do things that are formal or asymmetrical or Chinese or Italian or anything like that. In fact, you'll be surprised um, in a few slides how little correlation there is with certain kinds of plants versus their risk for quick ignition or long burning. So what firescaping is, though, 
It's making informed decisions. It's understanding how fires move, where your greater risks might come from, where other risks also might come from, and, and then making good choices based on the information you've got. It's taking care of your soil. It's kind of a weird thing to bring up, but if you've got healthy soil, you're more likely to be growing healthy plants, and healthy plants are far more resistant to something coming in and wiping them out quickly than unhappy plants. So if your plants are sick or stressed out, especially stressed out, they're more susceptible to getting in danger, just like me. If I'm stressed out, I'm gonna get a cold, guaranteed. If your plants are stressed out or have poor soil, then they're more susceptible to things going badly for them. Healthy plants, I just said that. Garden hygiene, we're gonna get into that a little bit. Um, that's a really good one. Proper pruning, I'm gonna show you some slides that illustrate the difference between shearing and pruning and how that can actually take the exact same plant and give you two completely different conditions in the event of a fire. And understanding your risks. So. Your ignition sources, this is kind of an easy, low-hanging fruit list from the out of doors. But I want to make a point here. Even though barbecues and workspaces and oily rags, they're all kind of, you know, garage to the outdoors kinds of risks, what about your next door neighbor's kitchen? How about somebody throwing a cigarette out of their car as they drive away or drive by? So these risks aren't necessarily always things that you can control. Sometimes they come from outside, and it does not have to be a wildfire that comes towards you. It can be a house fire, a structure fire, a car fire. So that's an important thing. Be aware, like where I live, I'm near the freeway. I'm very aware that if someone has a wreck and there's a car fire, I am super close to that and that can just send a spark my way, and I don't have to have a wildfire in order to have that problem. So, fire's passions. Now, this is where you start thinking about where you live. Fire loves to go up. It's kind of easy for it. It sort of does its own thing. I won't get into that. It runs with the wind. The wind can blow it uphill. The wind can blow it back down. The wind can blow it sideways. The wind helps these fires become more intense, or it can get them to back off and be a bit less intense and go back where the fuel has already burned out, which is wonderful. But you can't count on the wind to save you. Um, it is important to know, for wherever you live, where is the wind usually coming from? For some people, it comes from different directions seasonally. For other people, it's always the one direction. So be aware, if your wind always goes the one direction, quite possibly a fire will have a tendency to go that direction. There's no guarantees, because fire can do some weird things, but it's a thing worth considering and being aware of in your own property. It likes to climb, like up trees, up ladders, um, up, 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 and up. And then, of course, it burns stuff as it goes. And I've seen some really strange examples after the uh, North Bay fires, where a fire has burned, like, say, halfway across a log and then stopped. No reason. It burned completely a perennial, that was a foot from another perennial, and one of them is scorched, and the other one is just sitting there like, what? So it does some odd things that I can't explain. I hope someone can, but it's not me. Um, and I want you to be aware of where you live as far as whether or not you're in a place where it's easy to find you. Sometimes these beautiful, quintessential, little more, uh, Rural roads can be absolutely idyllic for a hundred years. You have a fire come through and nobody wants to drive down that. If it's, if it's burning, you've got trees overhanging the driveway and a bunch of brush at the edges. It can possibly be too dangerous to go down there in the event someone or a structure is at the end of a long and winding road. Now, down here in Berkeley, we don't have this condition too often. It's much more urban, 
um, very heavily treed though. So be aware of, of whether or not you have a potential to be a trap and if you've got a way out that can circumvent that. So um, firefighters, it, it's a job I have mad respect for because they sometimes have to make really difficult decisions about what they can safely defend and what they can't safely defend. And those decisions, it's not something that I would wanna have to make. It, I just don't think I could. So there's a bunch of different approaches and I'm gonna walk you through two or three. One approach is saying, you know, because everybody wants the quick mantra, reduce, reuse, replace. It's kind of like the recycling thing. Um, but check this out. It's all about fuel. It's all about redu removing things that are dead, removing de dead plants, reducing the fuel load, so pruning and mowing. We're, we're trying to remove excess dead wood or keep the lawn from getting too tall, and you'll see some great examples of that in a minute. Replacing fire magnets, like the city of San Rafael is offering incentives to remove juniper and bamboo. So that's huge. A lot of people love bamboo because it's so pretty, and it's such a wonderful screen for outdoors. Um, but it is a, also a fabulous big butterfly net to catch sparks. And sparks, in my understanding, are one of the quickest, fastest, most common ways that a fire spreads from one location to the other. It's not just gonna belly crawl along the ground, it's also gonna throw those little sparks out and start fires in other places. So keeping those fire magnets like juniper and bamboo away from your home is a good tactic. Stressed plants, obviously, we already talked about that, and irrigation. When we have a drought, just turning off the water can create a lot of dead wood. It can create a lot of fine fuels and, and dead branches and stuff like that. And we don't wanna just shut it off and stress everybody out. So proper irrigation is important. I'll spend some detailed time on that in a moment. So there's the zone thing, right? Everybody heard the defensible zone thing. This is a different approach. This is, this is kind of borrowed from a few different places. This was one person's approach, is just l work at your fuel. Another approach started in the 50s or 60s, and it's the zone model. And I'm gonna show you two zones that are kind of sort of the same thing, but they have a, a one is much more fine-grained. These are from a book called Firescaping by Doug Kent, and the other one is from a, an organization called IBHS. And those guys study sparks and study structures and all this stuff out at this really weird lab in North Carolina. It's a huge warehouse where they build little, like, full-scale fake houses, and they blow sparks at it and see what happens. So it, the idea, obviously, is that closer to the house, you want to bring it down, slow it down, help the fire get less intense and shorter the closer it gets to something precious like your home or another structure. And so in the typical zone one, that goes from your walls out to 30 feet. And in there, the primary goal is to make it possible for people to get out and firefighters to get in, and the best way we can do that is keep paths clear, have access routes, have visibility, um, and these tall wood fences are uh, not so great. So if you take a look at this, we have a narrow side yard. I don't know whose side yard this is, but we have a narrow side yard, and we're for thinking from a fuel perspective. That tall wood fence right there is all kinds of firewood just waiting. It is just waiting and it's nice and solid so a spark can't escape through it. It's probably there for privacy. My suggestion would be consider taking your privacy inside, curtains and window treatments rather than relying on a lot of fuel right outside the house to do it for you. And also whoever this is planted a tree smack in the middle of the side yard now, as that tree grows, it's a spark catcher right next to the house. Um, it's in the way of people getting in and out. And as it grows, it's just going to get bigger and, yes, more pretty. 
but it's going to become a greater and greater problem from a fire escaping perspective. So I want to encourage people to think about how do you slow a fire, make it, help it get shorter the closer it gets to anything precious, and selecting low flammability plants. So we're going to get into the plants in a minute. We want to use building materials that are resistant. There's building code that can help you with that. There's city officials that can tell you all about roof systems and different kinds of windows and window framing and siding and all that. There's a whole world of architectural materials out there. Um, and then work with your neighbors. This is something I think is super key. And I'm going to show you one of my absolute favorite things soon. And then practice good garden hygiene, and we'll get to that towards the end. So now, this is sort of new to me, the newer inside zone one, zone one. The IBHS suggests a zero to five zone. They like paving, basically. I don't really love the idea of having a sidewalk to smack up next to my house walls. Um, they're suggesting, you know, rock mulches, um, this very, very small plants. It's kind of the opposite of what we do traditionally with the big shrubby foundation plantings. But their whole reasoning is the same thing that, that, that all the defensible zones are, is to bring it down. Because a fire, this is my reminder, a fire can get three times the height of the plant that it's burning. Now with some things like juniper, it far outstretches that, it is way bigger. And I have no idea why this woman is holding the little boy next to a grass fire, or who's taking their picture. Um, <laughs> but I love that. And you can kind of see, this is not tall grass, but take a look at how high that last little bit of orange is. That's pretty stunning. So when I started looking at this and then started peeking out the window at my own yard and started doing a little mental math, that big, that big, three times. Holy cow, that's my whole dang house. I have so many things around my house that if they were on fire, they would be over my head, well over my head. And that's really unnerving. It's pretty, but it's very unnerving. So be aware that when you're planting something new, consider what, how, what it is, how big it is, and where are you putting it. And you may not want to put that rosemary right next to your your best window to get out from, that kind of thing, because you could have something this big create a flame that's taller than me, which is pretty scary. Okay, now fire ladders. There's, you've probably, most of you have heard the term fire ladder, and um, there's lots and lots of diagrams, but I wanna point to a few things here. So we've got this low grass, whatever this is, it's not a very clear photo, but it's the best example I've got. Then we've got little, little fingers or whatever of flame. I don't know what this shrub was, but it's toast, right? And as this fire comes through, it's done here, dinner's over. Now it's gonna keep going, keep going. You see that pine tree on the other side? And it's got those weird little dead fingery twigs that stick out at the bottom as they seem to all have. Those are probably no longer living. Even if they were living, they're very, very low to the ground. And these flames can come over here. And even if that fire is going quickly and burns right past that pine tree, and it could, if it's going slowly enough and it hits one of those twigs, it can get on that little twig. Now it can climb up the trunk and it can get to more and more and more fuel. And then it's up in a pine tree. And those things, even if it's not a pine tree, are way bigger than me. And they can hold a flame for a good long time because it's got all that great wood, it's got all that wonderful bark, it's got all that fuel up in there. And the fuel, any plant, will burn. It's not that some do and some don't. They all will. What they need to do is lose the moisture. So what we need is too little irrigation. I'm going to show. Talk, I'm going to repeat this in a minute. Um, a really hot day, a really windy day. Wind can dry out a plant faster than heat. Um, all those things and all of that becomes super flammable, and it's wonderful for the flames to go have a good time. Where? There we go. 
So I'm going to jump around a little bit in here, but it all relates back to where is your risk coming from? Where is it going to? And if you're there at the time, how are you going to get out? So you want to have a highly visible address so that people can come get you, the professionals. You don't ever want to block firefighter access, even temporarily. Can I just admit, I learned this the hard way. I'm a gardener in my own yard, and I will cut and prune and pull weeds and make huge piles right in the side yard, which is this wide. And then I poop out and I go inside. And I did that the day that the Oakland Fire Department came by to inspect. I was gardening, I got tired, I went inside. And they said, no. <laughs> so now it's on this list here. Don't even block it temporarily. If you're gardening and making a big pile of stuff, stop, clean it up before you're tired, then go inside. I do that now. Um, reconsider that solid fencing. It can be wonderful for privacy, but it's just not wonderful for a whole lot of other reasons. And then the multiple ways in and out. Now in your garden, let's say you're in the front or the back or whichever part might be enclosed, is there one way out? Is there two way outs? Can you hop the fence? Um, all of those things are things to think about. You want to store, obviously, store your firewood someplace where it's not a risk to you or increasing the risk to your neighbors or blocking access. Check your shed for problems. A lot of times we can focus really hard on the house and forget our storage areas, forget the sheds, forget the part under the deck, that kind of thing. And then rethink um, what, what I call is like, physical planty barriers, like this agave. If someone's in the front yard of this house, they gotta go over blue agave to get out. And I hadn't seen another example until I was driving over here tonight on the drive up. I saw another house that had the same condition where they've let these spiky, spiky blue agaves take over the front yard. So there's really no good way out unless you can use this little tiny path. And that, to me, just seems like a really bad idea. OK. So fences with a capital E. Um, we want to use fences that are not so combustible. So the solid wood fencing, maybe not so much. Maybe something with some holes that a spark could go through. And we might have the chance that it dies out before it hits something flammable, before it hits something it can ignite. We want to give critters a way out. Now, granted, not everyone's dog needs an easy way out, but there may be someone who doesn't have an escape artist, and you can have something where if you get out, you could go you know, open a little doggy door, let Fido back out, or whatever. It's just worth considering having multiple ways for people and pets. Using thicker posts and heavier pieces of wood in your outdoor uh, decks and fences and things, I've read, now I want to be corrected, I've read that a thicker post is harder to ignite by a spark than a thinner post. It's the same material to me, but I read it, so I wrote it, okay? Um, and gates, this is one of my absolute favorite things. Gates are all well and good, but what about a gate between your property and your neighbor's property? We always put that gate from the back to the front, but what about between properties? How about we work with our neighbors and give ourselves a way out if the front, if the side yards are blocked, maybe we can go through the backyards. So that's one of my favorite ideas. Um, you want to, like, I think I've already mentioned this, evaluate the ways that you could get off your property if you heard about a fire and how many different routes do you have out. Then think about your evacuation plan or what routes you could take to get someplace safer and then collaborate with your neighbors to reduce each other's risks. Don't plant trees that are going to overhang your neighbor's eave. They don't have control over your trees, and you don't have control over theirs. But we could be working together to minimize each other's risks, and frankly, I think that's the better plan. 
Take your privacy inside, like I said, rather than relying on things like bamboo, rely on things like curtains. They're indoors and they're not out there catching sparks. And then share what you learn. If you hear some good tip or you grab one of those fire books from the back, share it with someone. So I just wanted to show some examples of how non-solid wood fences could be very attractive. It doesn't have to mean that it, that it looks completely mechanical or freaky or steel or whatever, but you, know, you could have gates and things that let a little bit more air circulation, maybe that one spark you didn't need through, and instead of igniting this surface, it goes through that one, and that one spark, nothing happens. That's one spark, less risk. Um, might not be that, that interesting when you have a whole mess of them coming at you, but I like every little bit I can get. And then avoid obvious conflicts, like keeping your barbecue under your eave, or having um, barbecues near flammable materials, or keeping trees from overhanging your building, um, and storing things under decks, which we're gonna see now. So skirt or screen, this doesn't make a lot of sense until we see the next few photos, but we wanna make sure that the undersides of decks, which are very often overhanging a slope, right? And if a fire wants to come up a hill and you have a deck overhanging a slope, let's say it's coming towards me from you guys, then I've got a wonderful place for the sparks to blow up and hit something that they could ignite. So we wanna minimize that, and I'm gonna show you a couple of kind of weird ways to do that, like stuccoing the underside of your deck. What a weird idea. But if it hits stucco, it, a little spark can't catch stucco on fire as easily as it can old decking or old wood. So that makes a lot of sense. But you know, just saying, hey, you need to stucco the underside of your deck doesn't. And then non-wood decking. A lot of people ask me about this. And what I understand is that if this area, let's say this is this, is in, the, is in a fire event, everything's hot, everything's dry, the wind is blowing, there's lots of smoke, the artificial woods can get brittle in those circumstances. And even if it's not on fire, it may not be structurally sound anymore. So it may not be safe to walk on. So I just wanna put that out there. Okay, so there's that wonderful spark catcher. We would love to not see firewood stored on here or a bunch of weeds piled up or whatever else, your fireworks maybe. We would love to see something more like this. Even better would be fine mesh screening, metal screening, not that vinyl stuff. Um, something that a spark can get to and not ignite would be far better. This is still better than that though, right? Okay, so we're gonna move on. This is my reminder that all plants burn, period. So, they will all burn. All they have to do is get warm enough or have enough stress to have insufficient moisture. Or get a spark just beefy enough that when it hits, it can start something, kind of keep something going, and then ignite the plant. And there's been some, there, to my knowledge, there aren't good, really scientific studies that study plants and burn times. But there are two where people went out and tried it anyway. There's one in Australia, and there's one from Las Positas, no, not Las Positas, Las Pilitas Nursery, and that one is wonderful. But if you look through their list, what they did is they went out and they'd grab a twig off of, off of a plant. Because they're a nursery, they can do that. And then they'd run inside a barn where there's no wind, and they lit it with a little butane torch. Almost everything caught fire in under a minute. Some things went foomp in seconds. Um, very few things took longer to ignite. If there's a fire nearby, and I have under a minute for my plants to catch on fire, that's just not enough time. So I want to point something out with this photo. I like this palm tree. Anybody see where that fire came from? It did not crawl up the trunk. So you'll see the trunk is dark. There's no sparks. There's no glowing. 
So whatever it was, it came through the air, hit the canopy, hit those dry fronds, and now a palm tree is on fire. And it can tell two friends, and they can tell two friends, and then the sparks can keep going right through the air. So just be aware that that can happen. Keep your plants clean, especially palm trees. Denser fuels like these fronds, they're pretty, if you ever hold a frond, they're actually kind of surprisingly meaty and, st and stiff and sturdy. And they can hang on to a flame, but they also have those leafy parts that are super dry and brittle. And those will ignite really quickly. And so keeping these palm trees clean would be really, really huge. Um, plants with finer fuels, smaller leaves, that kind of thing, they'll ignite faster, but there's less to chew on once a fire's there, so they may burn out more quickly. And then plants with more surface area, like lots and lots of leaves, or lots and lots of dense undergrowth, have a lot more surface area to just catch a spark, hang on to it for a minute, and let that fire get from place to place. Okay, so I'm gonna make some really generalizations. It's something I hate. I don't like making generalizations, but I want you guys to kind of take a look at this. It's generally understood that non-resinous plants are less, or wait, sorry, <laughs> more flammable than resinous. Wait, I have that backwards. I had it right the first time. Non-resinous plants are more watery sap less gummy, less sticky, less waxy. Those gums and stickiness and waxes are like wonderful fuel, okay? So if you have a deciduous tree like an apple tree versus an evergreen like a pine tree, you're looking at something with a lot of sap, a lot of gum, a lot of the gunk. And the other one, maybe you pull off a leaf, it's just kind of wet. Theoretically, the apple is less flammable than the pine but it depends on how it's being grown and the conditions, and I'll get to that. Thick leaves, less flammable than thin leaves. That's more about how much moisture might be held in the leaf. A thin leaf will have less and can dry out faster. Slower growing, slower growing plants tend to be denser. Now, it's a generalization, it's not perfect. So if it's denser, it may take longer to ignite but it may hold a flame longer once it does. Does that make sense for everybody? Groovy. Fewer branches and fewer leaves, obviously less surface area, and then less leaf litter. If you have a plant or a tree that just drops everything once a year and you end up with a huge buildup, that's a fire hazard. I love leaf litter. It's a healthy thing, but too much leaf litter is a problem. And then, Open branching habit, we're gonna see an example of that. Watery sap is less flammable than th things with thick and gummy sap. Fragrance-free foliage, what would that be about? Oils in the plant are what make it fragrant. And oil will be more flammable than something that is not uh, fragrant and is more just watery and whatever. Okay, and hairless versus Hairless and, and non-fuzzy, I love the Stachys byzantina. They've got those little fuzzy leaves. When a spark comes by, it hits those little hairs and it can stick better than just sort of not sticking. Does that make sense for everyone? It's got that super fine fuel right down there and it can just kind of keep going. Okay, so we're gonna talk about water and I'm running out of time. So water need is not directly related to whether or not something is very flammable or easy to ignite. There's a lot of talk about the drought and using different tools to find out what your plant's water need is. Let me just tell you, drought tolerance and fire resistance are not related. They are not. You need to evaluate your plant, its size and shape, its growth habits, and what it's got contained in it its density, its fineness, all those things we just went over. And don't buy into that drought tolerant is flammable, drought tolerant is not flammable. It's, it, there's no relationship that I'm aware of. I have not been able to find one at all. Um, and the amount of heat needed to ignite a plant 
is directly related to the moisture content in the plant. So a lot of people point to succulents, but then they don't maintain them. And you know those weird little potato chips, the little dried leaves that fall off way down at the bottom? The succulent itself may have a lot of moisture in it, but if you're not clearing away those little dry leaves, those crispy little things, then you've got a lot of kindling just sitting right underneath. Now, things like hydrangeas I love to pick on because if it gets hot enough, they just wilt. They may have enough water, but they're like me and they just wilt. Um, insufficient irrigation, obviously not enough moisture in your plant. Too much irrigation can have the exact same effect and the plants can wilt because they can't take it up because their root systems are drowning. Low plant available water, that goes right back to soil health. If you're mulching and using compost, then you're improving your soil's ability to make water available to the plant. So mulch and compost are excellent, excellent things. And there we go. And mulch, gorilla hair. This is the only gorilla hair I wanna see in my neighborhood. But, and I'm not even sure I wanna see him. Um, Gorilla hair is that super fine, super shredded mulch. And a lot of people believe that it's great for slope retention, but it does not do as good a, a job at that as they would say. A better thing for slope retention is compost. It's kind of weird. Um, chunkier chips of mulch. You guys probably can already follow this train of thought now. Chunkier chips may ignite less quickly, but they'll hold a smolder longer. So it's worth thinking about when you're choosing your mulches to be careful about what you're putting close to your home. And flame retardant applications can wear off. And in some studies from the University of Arizona and the University of Nevada, they bought 10 minutes. 10 minutes is not enough for me. So um, I would be careful about that. And I would say rubber mulch is incredibly flammable. It's incredibly hot when it does burn and it holds on to a fire. So just don't even go there. Stick with the organics. Like I said, the um, Bay Friendly principles and the maintenance stuff was surprising to me, embarrassingly enough, that they just kept coming up. So soil health um, is absolutely key. As a landscape architect, I thought when I went to school that it would be all about plants, and the more I get into my career, it's all about the soil. Like, plant selection is great, but you're not gonna grow anything healthfully if you're not feeding it right. Um, and don't till your soil, don't compact your soil, all of those can rob your soil of nutrients and the ability to hold water. Proper watering for your plants, avoiding herbicides and other stressors and other toxins, and compost, of course. Now, here's a crepe myrtle. I want to get to this before somebody hauls me off. Someone's topped this crepe myrtle. It's just a great example of how a stressful shearing situation causes a huge flush of growth. We've seen this on sycamore trees all over the place, where people have pollarded them, and they go like that, and there's twigs everywhere. So that right there is clearly a lot of fine wood, probably some dead wood, a lot of surface area, a lot of tiny bits that can grab and hang on to a spark. We want to do proper pruning instead. It's all about the health of the plant. So check this out. Here's a crepe myrtle before with all this sort of weird twiggy growth that it just does naturally. And someone has appropriately pruned it. That's one plant in two different conditions, same one actually. Um, that one that's been pruned has a lot less to grab onto a spark. Still beautiful, but it doesn't have to look like that when we're done. So if we're not shearing and causing that quick flush of fine twigginess, we can create much more beautiful plants and beautiful shrubs that don't have that excess craziness happening. Okay, so maintenance, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I'm gonna give you a better resource. Um, we wanna keep things alive, we wanna keep them well hydrated, 
uh, avoid deficit watering. That's when you turn the water off and only water for things to survive, not thrive. I'm cool with that for a lawn. Get rid of the lawn. But when you want to keep a tree happy and healthy and keep it from accumulating a lot of dead material in its canopy that's hard to get to, then you really do need to have proper healthy soil and proper watering habits. And for trees, that's deep watering. That's infrequent watering. It's not turf grass watering. Um, and so for questions, I think I heard something. Put it on the card and I'm out of time. <laughs> I knew I would be. Okay, so we're going to not do the stockpiling of cuttings. I already did that. Leaf litter, I already talked about that. Avoid the invasives. Uh, Mexican feather grass is nasty as an invasive. And mowers and equipment. I'm happy to make this deck available. They have it. If you want to send it out, that's totally cool. Um, okay, we're at the end. My favorite takeaways. Get safe, get out. If they tell you to leave, leave. If they tell you what your evacuation plan is, use it. Um, I've been asked the question in a, in a firescaping talk, how do I know if I should stay and try to put out a fire near my house? Thing is, if you've got a fire here near your house, you're gonna have one here in just a minute. And if I'm working on this one, I can't be working on this one, and oh crap, there went another. Just get out. Just be safe, leave. You are so much more important than fussing at, at little fires when what's way more important is getting your loved ones out and yourself. Work with your neighbors, appropriate garden maintenance. This is a free guidelines book on the rescapecalifornia.org website. Um, I'm happy to write this down for anyone. And it's free as a PDF. Download it, it's got all of that maintenance stuff in it. Get the guidelines book. There's a gardener book. I don't like it as much. Get the guidelines book. They're both blue, which is the pits. And if you really want to read more about this, check out the firescaping book by Doug Kent. He did a wonderful job. And I think that's my talk. Okay. Oh, I tried. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jennifer. That was a, a tre tremendous presentation, a lot of information. I will make, and I'm sure my colleagues Sophie and Lori will also make available the link uh, to, those, uh, to those books so you can uh, spend more time with it. Um, what I'd like you to do now is, if you have questions about, Lori's presenta about um, Jennifer's presentation, Please write your question now on your card and raise your hand and we'll have somebody collect um, your cards now. Just gonna take a minute here before we go on to the presentation from our fire department. Okay, looks good. Now I'd like to introduce Chief Dave Brannigan. He's the fire chief of the city of Berkeley. Um, yes, thank you. It's all kinds of weird things that come along with this job. So. Thank you, I appreciate it, everybody. Uh, I just wanna start, let me just say, um, while I did not preview the content of the, her presentation, that was unbelievable. Like, you don't know what a gem of truth you were just delivered. Uh, so much of that was, is gonna actually be repeated in what I have to say, um, but so much of it is information I didn't even have. And if you look at my yard, I need to do some reading and we'll talk. Um, but I don't live in the hills, so it's a little different story. Um, so welcome, the other thing I wanna do is, is thank the council members, uh, we have some members of the Disaster and Fire Safety Commission. Forgive me if there are other commissions represented. Um, I don't attend yours as often, but um, it's this wildfire safety is always a concern in California. Oh, you were up here, I'll come up too. Um, 
Wildfire safety is always a concern in California. It rears its head in Berkeley about every 25 to 30 years, uh, most recently in 1991 and last year. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but around the state, last fire season, which there is no fire season anymore, it's just year-round, um, that has already bled into this year. And we've already deployed more mutual aid uh, crews and apparatus from Berkeley this summer than we usually do in an entire year. Um, so it is already happening in California this summer. Uh, we are already sending crews everywhere, um, and it's going to continue right through. I also want to acknowledge uh, some members of my staff. We have from our Office of Emergency Services, which is in the fire department, Jennifer Lazo, one of our emergency services coordinators. She is uh, involved in assisting with the evacuation planning that we're doing right now. She also does outreach um, to vulnerable populations and to every population in Berkeley for community preparedness, uh, training, CERT, Berkeley Ready, things like that. And she's also our social media guru, so I'm sure there are some tweets going out as we speak. Um, and then also from our office is Sarah Lana. She's also an emergency services coordinator, also helping out with signing up for AC Alert back there tonight. Sarah is um, really the city's one primary emergency planner. So she writes, she wrote our emergency operations plan, not in a vacuum, she coordinated the writing of it, uh, which was adopted by council last year for our first ever adopted emergency operations plan. She is also the principal author and coordinator of what will become the evacuation annex and wildfire uh, appendix to that plan. So we're working on that right now. We're gonna talk about that a little bit tonight. Um, but the, the quality and breadth and depth of the writing and the planning that we get out of Sarah and then Jennifer and Kinchin helping them out is really tremendous. So you're, you're lucky to have such a great staff in a city this size. Now, the last presentation was very interactive, had beautiful pictures. Um, Really nothing to do other than look and be in awe of the great information. Mine is totally boring, so now is your nap. I'm just kidding, don't fall asleep. Uh, but it's got, it's got some information. We, we handed out two flyers with this. One, a questionnaire that we would like you to return, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. One is an informational flyer and a plan for you to work on and take home with you. So we'll get into that a little bit. So let's talk about what happens from the fire department's perspective in wildfire. Uh, and specifically in, in urban interface wildfire like we had in 1991, like we almost had last October, the night of the North Bay fires, we delayed sending crews to go assist there because we had our own fire um, just behind Ajax uh, in the park, in East Bay Parks. Um, and so we had to make sure that was out and was not going to spread before uh, we sent anybody to assist. So. Let's picture the 1923 Berkeley Hills fire. This spread from about the point of uh, Lake Anza. It blew across Wildcat Canyon and Grizzly Peak and got down to Shattuck Avenue. Okay? Uh, that was wind driven, like the last speaker said. Wind blows it. Fire likes to go uphill, but when we get the Diablo winds going from east to west, they're hot, they're dry, fire blew down the hill, blew down the hill rapidly. Picture that in today's landscape of Berkeley, and probably most of your houses are in that path. Uh, many other people's homes are in that path. You see Berkeley is in that path. Uh, it, it would be bad. <laughs> and then imagine your fire department, Berkeley Fire, has seven fire engines. One house fire takes four fire engines, a truck, an ambulance, and a battalion chief to put out that one house fire. If we go to a second alarm, Every apparatus, except for two ambulances, are used on that fire in the entire city. So a second alarm fire, that could be a large two-story house, that could be an apartment building, could be a duplex, it could be two houses side by side. Um, so that's, that's what it takes. Now picture that fire blowing down from Lake Anza to Shattuck, and imagine what we're going to be doing. And let's, um, let me, I'm going to ask you, what are we going to be doing in that case? Are we going to put... I'm going, to use, I'm going to use the rhyme. Are we going to put the wet stuff on the red stuff? No. Actually, we're not. What are we going to be doing? Right from the council. Well, we're not going to be running. You're going to be running. Uh, and like Councilmember Wingraff just said, you're going to be evacuating, and we're going to be telling you to evacuate. And that's about all we're going to be able to do in the beginning of it. Um, another interactive question. Who's taken a shower? Has anyone here ever taken a shower? Okay, well, you're one up on me. No, I'm kidding. Um, 
the fire last year, the Tubbs fire spread from Napa to Santa Rosa in under an hour. Winds approximately 70 to 75 miles an hour. We're blowing embers three to four miles ahead of the fire front. So picture that, three or four miles. If you're at Grizzly Peak and we have a wind blowing to the west and it's blowing embers three or four miles, where is that? <laughs> right. Sacramento Street's gone, San Pablo Avenue's gone. Coffee Park was four or five miles. That's the neighborhood that burned to the ground, gone, everything, moonscape. It was four miles from the fire front. It jumped that far. People described the embers that were doing that, that fire spread like being in a shower of sparks. So picture you, you picture you're you know, in the shower, you wash your hair, you turn around, and it's sparks blowing instead of water. They described that miles ahead of the fire front. And then when you think about the last speaker and what you want it to look like under your deck and what you want your um, trees, do you want pine needles on your roof? Do you want your yard cleaned out of all the duff that might have fallen? Do you want flammable plants, I think? Well, you tell me, yes or no? <laughs> no, you don't want those things, right? Because a shower of sparks will light that stuff on fire. And I know that might sound unnerving, and it's a little bit supposed to. We try in emergency management not to present doom and gloom circumstances, but it is a stark reality. It is what happened in Santa Rosa. Uh, it is what happened in the 1991 tunnel fire in Oakland and Berkeley. It's what happened in 1923, and it will happen again in Berkeley someday. So that is why we are going to be evacuating, and you need to be prepared to evacuate. Um, I think it's self-explanatory in that situation that fire spreads unpredictable. One of the things we're going to ask you to do is to know at least two routes out of your property and out of the hillside, whether it's to the east or the west or the north or the south. Know where you live. Know ways to get out. Um, so our priority in that case is life safety, right? We want to help you. We want to get you out of there. Uh, we also don't do that very much. The police department does that. Uh, CERT groups do that. Um, neighbors do that for each other. All right? uh, we are going to be setting up wherever we can. We'll be um, in very low visibility. Sparks will be flying. We will see if we can, if we can get there early enough to get ahead of the fire and stop it like we did in October last year behind Ajax Place. Um, if we cannot, like in 1991, we will be working with the police to identify areas that need to be evacuated up to four miles ahead of the fire. Not always, but sometimes we're, we're prepared to do that. Um, we will make joint decisions about how to do that and how we're going to notify people. We have a lot of that in, works, in the works now, so we don't have to think about it at the time. And that's the whole point of this evacuation plan that Sarah is leading the charge on developing. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to be the police department, some fire crews, um, neighbors helping neighbors. It will be a matter of getting out before it's too late. So when I ask you to figure out a couple different ways out of your home, out of your yards, out of your neighborhoods, some of you will only have one way in and one way out if you're thinking about driving. Uh, the Path Wanderers are here right now. Uh, they do a great job of clearing paths. They try hard to partner with the city to get uh, help with that. I'm sure they would like to, <laughs> I'm sure they would like more. I wish. We always wish we could do more. We wish we could have perfect paths for everybody that worked for the, the world to get out, but we can't. It's the nature of how the city was built, the, the nature of the streets, the nature of the parking situation up there, and the nature of overhanging trees, garbage trucks, buses, fire engines, um, your cars coming in and out. Uh, it's a mess, and we refer to it as our, our spaghetti streets. Um, we're, we're leaning on a municipality in California that has what we consider a very good evacuation plan. Uh, when we, Sarah and Jennifer and Ken Chin and I all deployed up to Lake County three years ago for their big fires, two years ago, I guess, middle, into Middletown. And uh, Cal OES showed up and said, hey, we have a great plan that you guys should be considering. We're, we're there to assist Lake County in their efforts. Um, and we said, great, can we have a copy of that? <laughs> Uh, and we brought it home, and now we're adapting that, that model. What we want to do, and this is um, the draft of this should be done in the next few months, we're working with Parking and Transportation, uh, the Transportation Division of Public Works, we're working with the Police Department to identify smaller zones. We thought about council districts, we thought about, thought about fire districts, 
Um, we thought about police precincts, but all of those are too big. So we're, we're narrowing it down to smaller and smaller and smaller zones um, that we will then educate you uh, on where you live, what zone you're in. Um, we will help you identify, and this is where transportation comes in, major roads that are appropriate to send people to for evacuation, not all are. I think most of you probably know the big streets near your house, right? Spruce, Euclid, Marin, Grizzly Peak, the Alameda, all those things. And, and we have some basic maps from a few years ago that show most of those. We're gonna try to include um, help for each of the districts uh, that we identify for evacuation a couple of the major routes, but ultimately it's gonna come down to you. Like the council member said when we started this, this meeting is about what can you do? And there are too many people, fire moves too fast, and there are too few resources for us to be able to come to your house, knock on the door and say, we need you to evacuate. Why don't you go to the north, go to Wildcat Canyon, then head west. When you get to Grizzly Peak, hang a right. Go to Kensington. If Kensington's on fire, keep going to El Cerrito. If that's on fire, go to Richmond. If Richmond's on fire, Cross the bay, no fire, this is an important message, no fire has ever crossed the Great Pacific Fire Break. So far, Hawaii and Asia have been okay when California is on fire. So worse comes to worse, cross the bridge. Um, and I joke, but we're not gonna have time to even tell you that. We're gonna say, get out, and you're gonna have to, you guys are here, which means you're gonna do this, and you're gonna have to encourage your neighbors through whatever means to do that, and if not, you may have to knock on their door and tell them, hey, I know you need help, and maybe I know you didn't plan this because you're a you know, PTA and you've got too much going on, you need to go out and I think we should go this way. Um, so what our questionnaires are for you tonight that we would like back is the wildfire evacu evacuation questionnaire. One of the things that happened in the North Bay is people weren't notified. Uh, there was not a uniform method, uh, when people did use methods of notification, the people who are there to receive, uh, communications 101, right? I was a communications minor, so really it's not my total thing, but I, I paid attention. There's a message delivered, there's a message received, a message acknowledged, right? So when we give you an evacuation order, we need to know what's gonna work for you. What is gonna get you out of bed at two in the morning? What is gonna, um, be an effective way to communicate that with you. We've gotten a lot of feedback about siren systems. Um, are, are, you know, are we gonna use bullhorns? Are we gonna use PAs? And the answer is no on the sirens yet. We're looking into it. Um, our beloved city council just gave us a, uh, a few referrals over the last few months after the fires to consider and prioritize. And of the 81 of those, um, one of them is siren systems, which we're looking at. Um, th there's some issues with those, which we can talk about afterwards if you have questions. Uh, they may work, we're not sure yet. But things like AC Alert, which please sign up tonight before you leave. Um, if, you, if you can't sign up tonight, um, Google AC Alert, go to the City Berkeley website, you'll find the link. The trick to that though is your phone has to be on. If you have an, who has an AT&T landline? Who knows what, wow. <laughs> this, is, this is a different part of Berkeley. Um, <laughs> If I, if I did this at UC Berkeley right now for students, they'd all go, what's, what's a landline? Um, great, so actually, that's good because we can, we can um, send an AC alert and if you have signed up and you have a cell phone uh, or you want it sent to your email, you have to sign up to get that service for the most part. But we can automatically hit your AT&T landline, your old school, don't have to plug it in, it just goes to the wall, it's got its own power. We can wake you up with that, so that's good, this crowd pretty solid. Um, but what we want out of this questionnaire is for you to tell us what will work for you, um, amongst other things on here, because we're not going to, we, well, we are the experts, but we're not you. And uh, what works for the community in Berkeley might not work for Santa Rosa, it might not work for Pleasanton, and AC Alert serves all, uh, all of Alameda County. We tailor it for our, um, our city. Um, now the zones are being finalized. This is not the final map. I just wanted to give you guys a sample tonight of what we're looking at. So we are looking at an area around Grizzly Peak, All right? So Grizzly is right in here. There's Ajax, Park Hills. Um, it travels here. As you can see, these are response quadrants. So the overlays are a little funny, but this is a response quadrant uh, in here. 
this is a response quadrant here, and they're all labeled with a little number. It turns out to, to do our dispatch system, we have to break up the city into these small little quadrants. And these are just about the right size for what we think we would want to say. This group, let's say, let's say there's a, <laughs> this, this is the uh, Brazil room. Um, so Lake Anza's up here-ish. So if, if the fire is blowing this way, our incident commanders might work with police and say, okay, I need zone 83, 85, 81, 80, 74, 73, 72, 64. We need all those evacuated right now, no questions asked, get them out. We need, and then you know, we could list off all these numbers and say these are on an advisory. Uh, the city way over there would be like, you know, San Pablo Avenue, put them on an advisory, maybe shelter in place, or maybe just leave. So this is, this is the model we're going with. These zones already exist in our dispatch system. The idea would be we could load uh, the perimeters of each one and label them, put them in our emergency alerting system so we could just push a few buttons, everybody in that zone gets a notification. Part of the questionnaire too is, we need to figure out the best way to educate you on where you live. Um, we thought about naming them, <laughs> and there are about 100 across the whole city. So then we thought, well, we're not gonna be able to come up with 100 names, right? It's not gonna work. So we're gonna leave them as numbers. They're gonna be sequential. Um, it may not make intuitive sense to you where you live because you're maybe zone 84. Uh, and the, the borders may be questionable, right? Is, is this uh, 65 and this is 66, so what's this right here? There'll be a little bit of ambiguity. Um, but it's gonna be important that we constantly push out the message, constantly train you, that you communicate with new neighbors, that you can communicate with people who come and go in the neighborhood, um, so that if a message comes out, if there's a police officer driving down the street saying, we need you to evacuate, or if you hear, because there are a number of ways you may receive information that it's time to evacuate, um, we want it to be clear that if you know where you live and you know what your number is, if, if we are just hurrying as fast as we can, um, you hear, oh, zone 65, wait a minute. Well, I live in zone 65, I gotta get out of here. You're gonna go. Um, so that's another thing in the questionnaire. We want feedback from you on how to finalize this plan and, and make our public education uh, plan for, for helping you get through this. Um, so what do we need from you? Other than all the stuff I just asked you for. Uh, we need you to evacuate immediately. Um, if you receive instructions, that's great. If you don't receive instructions, and you're like, man, it's a hot windy night, I heard it's a red flag day. Uh, boy, why are all these sirens going by? Huh, there's a funny glow. That's not San Francisco. What's going on? That's coming from the park, the park's dark. Go. <laughs> if you're not sure, go. And especially if you have any issues that may slow you down, if you have any people in your home or your next door neighbors who have special needs who will need that extra bit of assistance, please go. Because we can't, uh, I, I'm not gonna say we can't, it will be challenging for us to devote resources to people who need extra help. So if you already know you need extra help, make a plan now. Use the other handout we gave you to make that plan. And be prepared if it's possible for you, if it's possible for you, be prepared to evacuate without your car. There are numerous uh, videos and pictures of the 91 Hills fire of people who died because cars were stuck behind each other because they were down behind a power line. Firefighters died because of down power lines. Um, you will be stuck behind them if that happens and you're in your car. Some people, you have to get out in your car. We understand that. Um, but if you have a bicycle, if you can be on foot, if you have a wheelchair and there's a path that's possibly accessible to you, if there's a street that's accessible but you don't want to drive but you can get out that way, get out that way. So when you're planning your evacuation routes from your home, consider paths, consider streets, consider alternate methods of getting out. And while we had the Grizzly Fire last year, it was my first day of vacation, I had a lovely lunch in San Francisco, and I came out and I looked and there was a huge plume of smoke coming up from the Berkeley Hills. And I thought, I swear, I'm supposed to be on a plane in a couple hours to go to DC. I took a lift from San Francisco back to Berkeley <laughs> to my office to get my truck because I was on vacation. And that Lyft driver, I told her, I was like, hey, we're gonna get, I'm gonna just carry like one of those old lights, like, you know, from uh, those old cop shows and just put it on your roof and then you can go and we'll put a little Berkeley fire sticker on you. So um, Lyft and Uber are not gonna come get you if the hillside is on fire, I, I wouldn't think. Um, so, so what does your plan need to look like? You need to be ready to receive emergency alerts and I feel like we've beaten this, uh, a horse tonight, uh, that's probably not a good way to say it, but um, 
Uh, sign up before you leave tonight. Here's a, actually a little, um, so Nixle and AC Alert are tied together. You, if you sign up for Nixel, or if you have already, that's, that's mostly controlled by the police department. They put that out around policing issues and community issues, traffic problems, things like that. If we send an AC Alert, we have the ability for that also to go out on Nixle. Now, if you're on Nixle, we still want you to be signed up for AC Alert because there are differences sometimes, depending on what you sign up for. And there are different categories when you sign up, so you don't have to get, like we'll put out community information sometimes, um, but you don't have to get that, just don't check that box. And you can go back into your account after the fact and change it. Right now, if you have no other thing to do, and I'm droning on and I don't have any good pictures, and last year I had a cool video, but this year it's just text, um, do this right now. If you text from your cell phone, your zip code to 888-777, uh, you will be signed up for Nixle, right? You, you can do it right now. Um, and if you don't want to do that anymore, then you just text stop. Uh, and you can text stop once you've signed up for AC Alert too. The other thing we want you to do is buy a map, right? We're, we've given you a handout that you can fill out and that will be your plan. <laughs> Conveniently, the Path Wanderer is here with maps that include their paths, which should be part of your evacuation planning. So, um, shameless pitch, I'm willing to do it. Uh, <laughs> Path Wanderers has great maps. I keep one in my car. Um, I live in Oakland, so I do not keep one at my house. Uh, I don't live in the hills in Oakland. Um, but that's a great way to do it. And we've, we've talked about uh, finding different ways to evacuate. Okay, so we emphasize a lot in Berkeley uh, emergency planning for pets, emergency planning for children, emergency planning for anybody with access and functional needs. Actually, Jennifer, one of her specialties is that exactly. We hired her and we immediately said, wait, in your interview you told, talked about all these lawsuits that big cities lost around um, providing emergency services to people with access and functional needs. Yeah, make sure we're good on that. <laughs> and so she did. She, she did a great job and she always reviews all of our plans for for ensuring that we can really provide preparedness and response to, to anybody who needs it in the city. Um, but, you know, neighborhood organizations, groups, being together with your neighbors, talking to each other, that's a great way to get, um, to get prepared as a neighborhood. Um, and then this is, this is a quick walkthrough of the, the plan you have, things to think about, uh, when to evacuate, what to wear. If you're in a shower of sparks and you're getting um, out on foot or on bicycle, maybe you want to have a thicker denim shirt on, maybe you want to have jeans on, maybe you want closed toed shoes, maybe you want a hat so that your hair doesn't catch on fire, right? It's, your hair is kind of like those fuzzy plants she sewed, right? At least, well, what I have left is. Um, what do you want to bring? Do you have a go bag in your car? Who lives east of here? Who lives, we'll say, let's just say the Alameda, yeah, so a lot of people. So you all live in the areas we're talking about. Have a go bag in your car. Do you, who, who has taken medicine before? Right, if it's medicine you think you need, or you know you need, that better be in your bag. And this is a, an issue that people often have talking to their doctors. I need more of my prescriptions so I can put it in there. Uh, work on that, try to get that ready to go. Um, and then when you get your map and you highlight your routes, keep these two things together. Put them on your fridge, put them in your freezer, put them in your go bag, whatever it takes, keep it together. And if you forget all of this stuff, you can go to the City of Berkeley website on wildfire evacuation. Uh, City of Berkeley, go to fire, there's an emergency, actually there's an emergency preparedness section before you get to fire, which is good, because that's where this is. Um, and again, we want you to turn these in. You can turn them in here if you're paying attention and you didn't want to write during all this stuff. We did actually put our address on the back, so you could just tri-fold it, tape it, put a stamp on it, and mail it to us, and we'll accept it that way also. Um, and that does it for me. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hand it back over to Councilmember Wingraff. And uh, really, uh, one last thing. You guys are the ambassadors, right? I can get up here and I got a shiny little badge on and, you know, funny uniform that's really weird to wear in hot weather. But, um, but you're the people who are going to go out back into the community and tell your neighbors, hey, you know what, we came to this forum tonight. We've done four of these now at this same location over the last few years. Get people to come to the next one. Um, and maybe, you know, bring somebody with you. Send somebody with kids. I'd love to talk about this with kids. Um, so see what you can do. Find your neighborhood groups. Get organized. And uh, we'll see you out there safely at an evacuation site when the fire comes. Thank you.
so much. Thank you, Chief Brannigan. Um, you have questions? Okay, if you have questions, um, we will have our helpers come along and collect them for you. Uh, I just want to say that um, w um, I have been working very closely with uh, Chief Brannigan to um, try to um, make you all safer. And um, I really, I really appreciate his cooperation and his dedication. Um, and I think we're really making some progress. So thank you, Chief Brannigan. Okay, now we're gonna talk about East Bay Regional Parks District. As you know, many of you live in what we call the urban interface. And um, Chief Aileen Taley is here tonight. We, she almost wasn't able to make it because she's been backfilling for Cal Fire. So we're really lucky to have her here tonight. We're really lucky the weather changed a little bit. And um, I'm really looking forward to the, to the presentation. I understand that East Bay Regional Parks now has some new protocols in place for their vegetation management. So let's welcome Chief Haley. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Some of you I've actually seen before. Hi, Mark. <laughs> so um, I'm actually here to talk to you tonight about uh, East Bay Regional Park District's Wildfire Hazard Reduction and Resource Management Plan, which sometimes I'll call the plan and sometimes I'll lovingly call the warumph because it's a mouthful. But I did want to say one thing. Um, there's been two messages prior to me. Um, they've been about a lot of things, but They've both said, and you'll hear me say the same thing too, um, I was up at the Lake County fires and when you're a firefighter, one of the very first things you learn that is your creed, is your Bible, if you will, is you have three priorities and they are in order, life, property, and the environment. So when you get an evacuation order and you don't go because you're worried about your home, what that does to us is make our focus you and not your home because you are our priority and will always be. And so you put us in a, in a funny place. And it's not to make you feel bad, but you have to understand that's how we're wired. So if there's a neighborhood with people in it because they're trying to save their homes, we're not gonna care about their homes at all. All we're gonna care about is getting them out. And I, there was a lot of criticism that I heard um, a lot of folks who had lost their homes suffered great loss asking, well, why didn't you try to put the fire out? Well, first of all, it's hard to put a fire out with 60 to 70 mile an hour winds. Um, but secondly, they were moving, the fires were moving so quickly that all we could do was get people out. So just try to keep that in the back of your mind when I know you're struggling with the choice of, this is my home, I've worked my whole life for this in some cases, or it was my, my family's family's home and, and I don't wanna leave don't put us in the, in the predicament where we have to make a choice between getting you out or saving your homes. Just something to think about. So this isn't exactly a new plan that we have. Um, this is a plan that came to be um, pretty much born of the 91, the fire department calls it the tunnel fire. You guys know it as the Oakland Hills fire. In 2004, after a blue ribbon group had been put together um, to kind of take a look at the fact that this has happened, as Chief Brennigan said, every 25, somewhere between 20 and 25 years, starting way back, um, I think, in the 1880s, this area burns. And maybe a little to the south, maybe a little to the north, but it's the same area all the time. So we decided that we wanted to kind of be a little bit ahead of the game, and, and I am very proud of the Park District for doing that, deciding that we needed to have um, a wildfire reduction, a, a, a fuel reduction plan um, that affected the wildland urban interface, which is all the homes up there bordering all the wildland. So there was gonna be four points to this, and these were our goals. Reduce the fire hazards on the district-owned lands in the East Bay. Maintain and enhance the ecological values for plant and wildlife habitat, consistent with those reduction goals, because after all, you guys can't hear me, really? 
I was trying to save you. <laughs> I'm not exactly uh, quiet. So because we were a park district, we needed to focus on um, the, the plants and the wildlife habitat consistent with fire reduction goals. We couldn't just go in there and clear anything. We've, we've got federally and state listed species, and so we had to be cognizant of that. We had to preserve the aesthetic landscape values for park users and neighboring communities. I mean, after all, a lot of the reason why people built up in the hills was because they wanted to be near the wildland areas. Um, but then we also needed to provide a vegetation management plan that was cost effective and kind of physically or financially and environmentally sustainable because the park district has been reducing fuels in some manner or another for about the last 60 to 70 years and we've done a lot wrong. So we wanted to learn and one of the biggest things we did wrong was we'd go in and do it once, right? Then we'd walk away. Well, plants grow back, trees grow back. So this is that horrible picture um, of what the area of the Oakland Berkeley Hills looked like after 26 people lost their lives and it cost about $1.7 billion in total. They were completely and totally devastated. That's all been rebuilt. This is what the East Bay Hills looked like in 1899, <laughs> right? Um, and this isn't necessarily abnormal. It's not like people went in there and said, well, we're gonna take all these trees away. It was grazed. But then we came in, whoops. We came in and planted. And this is the East Bay Hills 2009. And for any of you that know Tilden pretty well, this is right next to the, um, the Brazil room. So this is the Brazil room right here, and you're looking southeast. Quite a difference. This is Sibley around top. Anybody hike in Sibley? Okay. Sibley round top today, and this is after we've done some management. And this was part of the issue that happened was the East Bay Hills, um, there was a lot of eucalyptus plantations. And a eucalyptus tree in and of itself is not, not a big deal. Um, but plantations of any kind. I had, um, there was a, a lady during the first presentation that kind of asked a little quietly, do agave plants burn? Everything burns. Look at Coffee Park. At some point, under certain conditions, everything burns. So really, what we did was we came up with a comprehensive system-wide plan. It's based on science, um, ecology and fuels management. Basically what we're trying to do is, you know, there's, there's three things it takes to make fire, right? It's oxygen, fuel, and heat. Can't take the oxygen away, that's no good for us, right? Can't control the heat. The only thing that we can affect in any way, shape, or form is the fuel. We focused on follow-up and long-term maintenance because that's the mistake we'd made before, way back in the 60s and 70s, is if you go in, you can't go in and maintain a eucalyptus forest and then walk away, or not maintain it, I'm sorry, go in and, and just um, do some management activities and then walk away because it'll grow back stronger and faster. All trees and, and shrubs do. So it had to be a follow-up and long-term maintenance. And then it had to be evaluation, evaluated and reviewed for improvement. So in other words, we're doing adaptive management. That's what it calls for. Our plan is not for five or 10 years, it's for 20 to 30 years. And part of the plan calls for BMPs as they come, as, as new things come up, um, new methods, um, new applications, it's built in so that we can, we can do that. We can use those things. So here's the area of our fuels management plan. As you can tell, does anybody know what that line is? No, well, it is the Hayward Fault. It's also a ridge line. So, so you guys knew something I didn't. I know it's a fault, but for this purposes, <laughs> these are all kind of ridge line parks, and they're all in wildland urban interface areas. And, and really, the park district was founded on having a green belt up in the hills, right? Well, we've got one. <laughs> Um, but it's flammable, like everything else, and so it's our job to manage it. So it's 3,000 acres in total covering nine regional parks. Now, people have often asked me, do you guys have other areas outside of those, that specific area to the plan that you manage uh, for fuel? And the answer is yes, we do, all over the place. Um, 
Briones Parks over in the east, uh, Garen down in the south, um, even some areas around Ardenwood, and we do that in different ways, whether it be using crews or goats. Um, goats are some of our, our best employees. And you guys all really seem to like them. <laughs> so we knew this couldn't be done by just one group internal to the park district, and we also knew that it couldn't be just the park district. That's why here, we're here tonight speaking to you, along with, with uh, Berkeley Fire and along with Firescape and along with uh, PG&E, because really it takes us all. That's one of the biggest things that we've been learning from these fires is it's not just that Berkeley Fire do their part and that East Bay Regional Park District do our part, but you guys need to do your part too, and you're doing a great job. You're here tonight, as Chief Brennigan said. But internal to the Park District, we have the Stewardship Department, who are all of our biologists that are in charge of all the monitoring and the expertise um, and the the pre-analysis and the post-analysis and the evaluations to make sure that we're doing what we need to be doing and that we're affecting things in a positive way and not in a negative way. The fire department's the one that actually writes the contracts, goes in, writes the prescriptions, which is, okay, this is a specific area that we have and we call those RTAs. You'll hear us talk about RTAs and that's a recommended treatment area um, over those 3,000 acres that we have. In each RTA, there's no one prescription that goes to, it's not a blanket prescription that's applied to all areas. Um, some of you folks may back up to the park and you've got nothing but grassland. A mile away, there might be somebody who backs up to the park and there's shrub that goes up into trees, a mixture. So each prescription is really written to that specific site. Stewardship also has a say in those prescriptions and, and what they look like. And then we work with our operations staff to actually make it happen. When you're doing a massive fuel reduction area and still running a park at the same time with groups coming in and camping, um, day hikers, mountain bikers, dog walkers, um, you have to work really closely with operations to make sure that while we're doing our fuels reduction work, you all still get to enjoy the park safely. And then we work with our external par partners, City of Oakland, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, the Hills Emergency Forum, Diablo's Fire Safe Council, and then crews like the SCA, um, Civicor, and even CAL FIRE inmate crews that come in. Grazing is one of the tools that we use. Um, it's usually more in our maintenance phase because we have two phases of projects. We have initial entry, in other words, groups or areas that we go into, these RTAs that we go into that we haven't done any management in yet, and then of course you can only be initial entry one time and then maybe the next year that RTA may revert into a maintenance RTA. And we use grazing as one of our methods for maintenance. We use fire hazard reduction crews. Sometimes they're our own firefighters. There are often times when you'll see our firefighters out there doing work, um, whether it be pruning tr trees up from about a third of their height, um, removing shrubs that are dead, taking dead wood out and piling it up, and then we'll come back in the winter time and we'll do pile burns. Mechanical means, these are only for the really big projects. Um, we were using a feller buncher not too long ago for a bunch of pines that had come down about 10 years ago that had become very decadent fuel, jackpot fuels. They were too busy for tractors to get out, so since they were already down, we used a feller buncher, put them on a truck, they got hauled away. Prescribed fire. Prescribed mm -hmm. fire is something that scares a lot of folks, but um, I was just up recently in Sonoma, uh, which is a great place to, to have the last uh, fire consortium work group that they had. And they're really, the, the minds of the fire service are really starting to come back around and prescribe fire. If you have prescribed fire and you clean out understories under the right conditions, um, it can really help you later on down the road. It puts nitrates and things like that back into the soil, which is really good for some of the native plants that we have, really for all the plants. And it's another tool that we use. Here's some examples. Redwood or East Ridge Trail, anybody familiar with that? It's a great trail if you've got dogs. Um, this is what it looked like prior to us doing any work. And there was a lot of these pines in there, um, quite a few that were standing dead and quite a few that have come down. Um, one of the things that um, Jennifer talked about was the, the ladder fuels, the laddering. Why that's so important is because it's much easier for firefighters, since we're ground dwellers, to fight fires on the ground. 
So a fuel ladder is grasses that then burn up into shrubs that then burn up into trees. They've proven that the majority of wildland urban interface fires that happen, it's not the actual flame front that starts houses on fires, it's the embers that are cast. Like the last two presenters were talking about, embers that are cast. So what we try to do is we try to keep those fires out of the crowns of fires, uh, up, sorry, out of the crowns of the trees because once it's up there, it can cast embers much further. If it's on the ground, embers can be created too, but they're not gonna get on the loft or a loft up on the wind column and cast someplace we don't want it to go. So we went in, we cleared out a lot of the dead wood, we left a lot of the trees that were still standing there, and there's some, there's some grass and brush and trees mixed in, but that's much more enterable for firefighters to get in there and to put things out, and you're gonna have a lot less laddering happening there. Whoops, one too many. Here's some more examples up in Tilden. So up here, you see an area that hasn't been touched at all. The before picture, it hasn't been gone into at all. You've got a lot of dead eucalyptus that are down on the ground, and this is what we come in here and do. So there are some chips that are on the ground. You can't see it in that picture very well, but there was a bunch of little bay trees that, that were underneath just waiting for some daylight. So there's a lot of little bays that have come in there, and now that picture looks completely different. There's oaks and bays that are growing up right underneath it, and some, some eucalyptus. Here's another great example on a slope. See how much daylight you can't see over there? <laughs> um, a lot of those trees are very narrow. They're, very, they're planted very close together, and that's a really good representation of some of those plantations that, <clears throat> grown up, that had grown up and, and weren't maintained in any way. So this is what we come in and do. We create spacing, sometimes 10 to 20 foot spacing, sometimes a little bit more, and then we try to maintain it. There's another great picture, that's up in Tilden. Um, this is kind of close to Gillespie Camp. You're familiar with that? So there's a prime example, I think there's a pointer on here. Yeah, there's a prime example of the grasses that are about, those are about kind of halfway up my thigh on this when I was standing in the middle of it. They get into the coyote brush and it'll jump right up into the pine. So what we tried to do was pretty simple. We didn't do a whole lot in here. We brought the goats in and we took all the trees and we just kind of brought their skirts up so that the trees are still healthy and happy. Some of those branches down below were dead, dead wood, um, and they were kind of branching down into the grass. So we've removed that continuity of fuels there. And I think the lower two are pretty self-explanatory there. This is what we don't want to see. You can't walk through this as a firefighter. You can't even get close to it. This is a fire that you'd have to fight indirectly. This is a stop and lob or bring a bulldozer in. Um, this is what happens when you don't maintain some of those plantations that were grown. This is what we want it to look like. If it were a better picture, you would see that these in here are little oaks coming up. In this particular site, there's an elderberry right back in there and another one right back in there. And that's much more manageable. Why? Because the ladder fuel's been removed. So this is kind of a natural succession that happens, um, especially in an area where you don't have grazing. Maybe you just got the deer that come in. Um, this, I'm going to show you the, a before picture of this exact spot. Well, it's a little bit over about 20 feet to the left, but it's, it's, the, same, um, it's the same aspect in a, in a place in Anthony Chabot. So that's what it had looked like at one time. If a fire comes through here, you say, well, there's lots of grass and there's lots of brush, and there is. But we can travel through the grass pretty well, and we could put down water, which will, because it's a light, flashy fuel, it can combust really quickly, but we can also put it out really quickly. Once it gets into the brush, um, it's a little more work takes a little bit longer. And this is one of our biggest funding sources. Um, Measure CC, which expires in 2020, but it's what got us started, that supplied a lot of the money. We use it as seed source money when we get funds, um, when we get grant funds. We get lots of grant funds. We get fun, uh, grants from PG&E. We get grants from Cal Fire, um, grants from Diable Fire Safe Council. And we use that to take the Measure CC money and make it go further. 
Um, we also have a FEMA grant that we worked very hard to get. It took a long time, but we've got a lot of money to work with. Um, and then we've got EBRPD's general fund. And I think that's it. Thank you, Chief um, Tiley. Thank you very much. Um, I actually, um, I have a question. I'll, I'll wait for the question period, but I had heard a rumor that you were going to be removing um, flammable trees um, in Berkeley in our interface um, up around Summit. So I don't want to put you on the spot about that, but I, I did hear that, uh, that rumor. There's two different RTAs, recommended treatment areas, that are up around Summit. I'd have to know which ones they were, and I'd have to look at the prescription. Okay. I can't, I'm, I'm pretty good, but we have, uh, I think, 170 of them. I don't know them all that intimately. But um, I'm sure if it's in a recommended treatment area, um, especially if it's dead trees, we'll be removing them. Okay, so. great. Great news. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're running a little late, but um, we have a great team here from PG&E, and I know um, pg and has been in the news a lot, and um, uh, I want to I thank them very much for coming and um, letting us know um, what they're going to be doing now uh, for, to protect us and uh, vegetation management and uh, protection. So please come up. I don't know exactly who, who's going to be talking, but introduce yourself. Thank, thank you. you. So I'm Matt Pender. I'm the director of enhanced vegetation management for PG&E across the whole um, PG&E service territory. Um, and I'm going to be going through our community wildfire safety program, which is a suite of activities that PG&E is undertaking to improve uh, wildfire safety and minimize wildfire risk, again, across the whole service territory with a lot of connections to your area and the hills in particular. Before I get into that, um, Brian Biancardi is our local um, vegetation program management um, supervisor, and he's going to talk about some details of the wires that are in your neighborhoods and just some general education about understanding what's overhead and how they interact with trees so that you can understand sort of what's going on above you and, and what those risks are. So I'll hand it over to Brian. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, again, yes, my name is Brian Biancardi. I'm the local supervisor for our vegetation management program. I manage the Bay Area and the North Bay. Um, I'm also a Berkeley resident, although I live uh, down south from here. So one of the things I wanted to open up with was understanding our infrastructure. We've, get, we've been getting a lot of calls um, from concerned residents around uh, tree and wire contact, and that's a huge concern for us, but it's not always a risk. And so I wanted to help um, here with the community to understand when there actually is a risk and, and when there's not a risk. So. Um, I guess we'll start from the top, transmission lines. These are the, the large lines normally on steel lattice towers. They go from generation to substation, or they go from substation to substation. They're normally around 60,000 volts to around 500,000 volts. And as far as clearances for trees, we normally keep about 10 feet to 20 feet clear, right? So large, large clearances. And we do have these up in the hills if you go hiking. Um, then let's get over to wooden poles. So when you look up in front of your house, you have a wooden pole. The best way to think about it is uh, there's the most voltage on the very top, and then it decreases as you kind of come down. So if you look up, you have your large, probably eight foot cross arm with insulators and probably two or three wires on there, copper, aluminum, whatever it is. That's your primary distribution, right? That's the wire that we don't want a tree to touch. If a tree touches, it could uh, scorch the tree, it could throw a spark. Um, if that line comes down into grass, it could start an ignition. And so that's what we're really concerned about, is that primary distribution. It could be 4,000 uh, volts, it could be 12, it could be 21,000 volts. Um, and then for that, that's what we have the clearances around, right? So CPUC and, and CAL FIRE have uh, public resource codes and, and regulations around keeping clearances around those specific lines. 
So that's always above the transformer and it's always above um, a, a yellow high voltage placard, right? So once we step down there, come below the transformer, that's secondary line. It could be on a cross arm, it could be vertical construction, but it's a much lower voltage. Trees could touch that and it's not a big deal. Uh, the, the regulations actually say that if it strains or abrades, then pg &E has the obligation to do work. But if touching, it could touch one phase, it could touch two phases, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a risk. Um, you also have service drops. These come out of the transformers and go into your weatherhead uh, to your main panel. It's normally two insulated wires wrapped around a non-insulated neutral. It's called a service drop. Um, trees can touch that. There's no risk there. Um, and we don't do any kind of vegetation management work on that. So, so no issues there. Um, you also have underneath your secondary lines, you have phone and cable or communication lines. These are AT&T. This is Comcast. The best way to identify this is go look at the pole and, and look at where it attaches to the pole. Is it attached to a cross arm or is it just sort of pinned on there? Um, they're normally thicker, they're black. Um, some of them have uh, the, the, the sort of badminton rackets on there. Um, but those are uh, not ours, <laughs> I guess is the best way to say that. If there's an issue, um, call AT&T, call Comcast um, for that. Um, but there's also no risk there. Trees can touch that, that line and there's not gonna be any issues, okay? Um, and if there's questions on that, I guess write them down in the cards and we're happy to answer them during, during the panel. So I'll turn it back over to Matt and he's gonna talk about some of our, um, our new uh, wildfire safety plans. Thanks, Brian. So the, the summary from this is the wires at the top, particularly the ones off the cross arm that has a high voltage sign, those are the ones that we need to worry about. Those have high enough voltage to be a risk. And so if you do see trees that you think are too close to that, are within 18 inches in particular is the minimum uh, clearance, that's when you should call pg and &E and say, hey, I think I got a problem in front of my house. Trees are often um, encroaching on those communication lines at the bottom. Um, and frequently with the service drop that goes to your house. But again, the voltage on those is so low that it won't arc. It won't get onto the tree and create a spark or something like that. So the top is really the risk we gotta worry about. So uh, that's just a little bit of education. PG&E in 2018 um, has launched a comprehensive community wildfire safety program. And for all the reasons that others have talked about today, we know we need to do more and different than we've done in the past. There's a new normal of high wind events, high heat events, drought, uh, vegetation conditions out there. And so PG&E is undertaking this and we're doing it as much as possible in connection with and in partnership with our communities and our customers. I, uh, Treva and I shared this exact same deck with your fire chief and some other members of your local government uh, three or four months ago and we had an hour to go through this deck and talk through it and answer their questions. So we've been partnering and not just your community but with a whole bunch of other communities to make sure that people um, are understanding and that we can connect together because there are some things in here that uh, will impact you or have the p a possibility of impacting you and we want to make sure that, that folks understand and that your community representatives and leaders understand. So what are the actions we're taking? So on the left side is sort of how we stay aware of and engaged with what's going on throughout, the, throughout our service territory. So for the first time, PG&E has set up a dedicated wildfire safety operations center. 24 seven, we're monitoring what's going on in the system on a lot of different levels. One of the things we're monitoring, the second bullet there is expanded weather stations. So PG&E already has and has begun installing more um, weather stations throughout our whole service territory. So we can understand what the humidity is out there, what the temperature is, what the wind speeds are. So we really understand the risks in real time and can make decisions accordingly. Um, and then we're considering and working with CAL FIRE on how we add wildfire and infrastructure protection teams. So these would be teams that could protect our infrastructure um, from the wildfire or minimize wildfire risks around our assets. So that's sort of how we stay in real time monitoring wildfire risks. In the middle column is what we're doing right now to reduce the wildfire risks. The top bullet there is enhanced vegetation management. That's the, that's the program that I run for PG&E. Um, I'll get into more detail about it uh, later, but the bottom line is we need to create a little more space between vegetation and our lines to make sure that we, don't, that we minimize that risk and we don't have incidents. 
Um, so that's one thing we're undertaking. Second bullet is about reclosers. So we will be turning off the reclosing function. If you've ever experienced a brief, if the lights go out and then about 20 seconds later they flash back on, that's a recloser functioning. And that's a device that is intended to improve reliability. Instead of your power being out for two hours, it was only out for that 20 seconds. Um, the problem is those can create some uh, spark risks if uh, it's a high wildfire area. And so we, we are turning that off in some cases, in some areas, during wildfire season, which as we've discussed is an extending, you know, broad piece of the year these days, um, to minimize wildfire risk at the possible consequence of having a little bit longer outages when something does happen. Um, and then the bottom one here, which is the most impactful, is we're working on our protocols to proactively turn the power off to reduce wildfire risk if the conditions warrant. So again, going back to that first, thing, that first column, we have a 24-7 watch center that has weather stations throughout the state and if the, well, throughout our service territory, which is two-thirds of the state. And uh, if those conditions warrant, we will be prepared to turn the power off to eliminate the possibility of, a, you know, a spark starting from our lines. Um, so we're working with a number of stakeholders on that, with community leaders, um, you know, public safety organizations, the CPUC, uh, but that's something we want people to be aware of. And then the far right side talks about in the long run, what are we doing to change our system? This will take a long time. We have a big system with a lot of assets, so it's not gonna all happen overnight, but we're working on how do we deploy coded, stronger power lines that can maybe um, re resist certain uh, impacts. We're placing wood poles with non-wood poles to create an extra level of strength there. And then also developing microgrids in certain areas which can isolate communities and things like that. So where are we focusing these efforts? The CPUC, our regulatory body that regulates us, has provided us clear guidance on where we should focus these areas. They've given us this map of high fire threat zones throughout the state with the tier two and tier three zones very clearly delineated. And so as we look at the city of Berkeley, the tier two, which means elevated fire risk, is the orange, and the tier three, which is extreme, is the brown, which it's a little hard to see, but it's down here, as you'd expect, in the hills, and then obviously all this outside the city limits, but neighboring maybe some of your properties and homes um, is tier three. So these are the areas that we're focused most especially on doing these activities that I mentioned previously, in terms of vegetation management, in terms of long-term system hardening, and in terms of the, power sa the public safety power shutoff. Um, so that's how it looks, and I don't know where your districts are for, the, um, uh, for you guys, but uh, that shows you where the impacted areas are. I talked about the Wildfire Safety Operations Center. I, I think I gave most of the highlights earlier. It's a real-time, 24-7 um, area where we're gonna be watching all of our data inputs about what the risks are. Let me make one more comment on the high fire threat map. The CPUC website has this information in both PDF form and other forms for folks to look at where the high fire threat zones are. And then on PG&E's website, there's a, a portal, so pg&e.com slash wildfire safety. There's a place where you can type in your address and it will tell you what tier you're in. It'll tell you if you're in one of these areas that is um, you know, particularly higher hazard, either elevated or extreme risk. So public safety power shut off. Um, if you live on a, if you're served by a PG&E circuit that goes through the high fire threat zones, those things that were highlighted on the map, um, we are prepared to potentially deactivate power on that circuit to minimize risk if the weather conditions, uh, you know, cause that, drive that decision for us. So we don't take that lightly. We know that has a huge impact. We know that turning the power off puts other things at risk in your lives. Um, and so we are, are being very careful and thoughtful about this. So uh, it goes through several forms. Uh, at the beginning, we're monitoring and we're beginning to reach. So if the weather forecast, you know, in four or five days is really bad from a wildfire risk perspective, then we start monitoring and talking to people. We start reaching out to local fire departments, Cal Fire, et cetera, to, to talk about what we're seeing and what we're considering. If the weather conditions continue to look like we may need to take this action, then we begin informing people. We begin talk, uh, reaching out to customers, um, you know, phone, outbound phone calls from PG&E, text messages, emails, et cetera. 
And then if it continues to be that bad, then we get into the zone where we have to actually do it. We have to shut off the power. Again, we'll be notifying you know, repeatedly uh, and then working to safely restore power. So once those conditions have moved on, let's say the winds have died down or the humidity has come back up, um, then we'll have to uh, inspect our lines, go out and patrol to make sure that nothing came down and there are no risks uh, before we turn the power back on. So that's serious, that's, that's a big deal and we're not taking it lightly. The biggest, most important part of this for us is that PG&E has your best contact information. So again, pg&e.com slash wildfire safety. Um, there's a link there to make sure we have the right contact information for you and for you to select your channel of choice. How do you want to be communicated to, with? Do you want a phone call? Do you want an email? Do you want a text message? Um, that's, uh, that's something we want to know so that 48 hours in advance when we start you know, wanting to communicate with people about this decision we might have to make, that we can get a hold of you uh, and get that information to you. Um, so, uh, we, this is a last resort. We don't want to do this. We, don't, we know that it has huge impacts, but we want people in the high fire threat areas, so tier two, tier three, or served off of one of those circuits, to be prepared for this to happen one to two times during the peak of fire season which is now until potentially November, depending on how the weather goes. Um, so we want people to be able to, to um, be prepared for this. pg and making plans. We're going to communicate to you, but we want you to have a plan if we communicate this to you. If we ping you 48 hours in advance and say, hey, your power might go off um, because we need to minimize risk. Um, when it happens, we need to be prepared for it to be out for at least 24 hours. We think in most cases it won't even be that long, but you know, that's sort of the minimum to be prepared for. And in extreme circumstances where the weather conditions persist, these could last for two to five days. And so you know, it, it, it's the weather. You know, we don't control that and we have to react to it, but that's what we want people to be prepared for. Uh, again, notifications would be at least one hour up to 48 hours in advance, depending on how much warning we have about the weather. Um, and we want to make sure that you, uh, we have the right phone, text, or email address for you. Uh, we'll also be conducting direct outreach to medical baseline or life support customers. So some of our, many of our customers uh, have special conditions. Again, access limitations, but also medical devices that make it such that they really need power. Uh, we already have extensive lists of that, um, but you can check. You can call our customer. If, if that might be you or it might be your neighbor, you can call our call center and say, hey, am I on the medical baseline list? Um, and if not, I'd like to get on there so that uh, I'm made aware of this. Um, in cases where we have to do this, we'll be making sure we directly outreach to those customers before the you know, power goes out so that they can make a plan, uh, figure out how to you know, maybe stay with a friend or something uh, while that power outage uh, lasts. Um, so again, we have various uh, information on our website, pg&e.com slash wildfire safety, such that uh, you can think about what's at your house, you can look at emergency plans, you can update your information, etc. cetera. Um, we want you to be fully informed and uh, prepared if this has to happen. Um, so that was the public safety power shutoff. The other thing we're doing is vegetation management. We are expanding again the clearance between our lines and the vegetation. Um, the first two in blue here, four feet and 12 feet, um, are new regulations from the CPUC. So the CPUC um, in, in about January of this year issued new regulations which expanded the uh, area that we have to clear. At the bottom it says 15 feet and what that's talking about is that in the tier three areas, the extreme fire risk zones, we're looking to create fire defense zones around our distribution wires that really clear out most of the vegetative fuels from underneath our power lines. Um, that creates an area where fires will be slowed, where they could be on the ground instead of up in the canopies. It creates an entry point or an access point for PG&E or other first responders to get in and, and do things around the access or around the assets uh, if a fire is coming or something like that. And then it also enhances defensible space around your home, your property, uh, and those kind of things. So uh, this is something that we'll be coming and talking to customers who have distribution lines running across their property in tier three areas to talk to them about this work that we'd like to do on their property and work with them on that. Um, and then electric system hardening. 
Uh, again, this is a long-term, long-running program. Um, in the last five years, we've already spent $15 billion making our system stronger, making it harder. We're constantly revisiting our uh, design standards to make sure when we upgrade assets or put something in that it's strong, it's going to last for a long time, and it's more and more wildfire resilient than what we've had in the past. Um, and I already mentioned a few of those details, but that's the long-term uh, system change as we move forward that you'll start to see our assets look differently than they have in the past. So I went through that really fast because it's getting a little bit late. We want to leave time for questions. But uh, what I really want to leave you with is there's a lot more information on our website. You can also call our contact center. They have this same information. They can check what it means for your house, your property, or your account. Um, and pg and &E is developing our plans for how we're going to help prevent wildfires, how we're going to respond if they occur, and we want to make sure you guys have a plan if we have to deactivate power proactively, if we come to your property to talk to you about vegetation management, we want you to understand why that's important. So, sorry if I went fast, trying to keep us on track, but uh, submit your questions if you got them, and uh, we'll be happy to chat afterwards also if, if we don't have time for the, your questions. Okay, wow. Well. Um, okay, it's a little late, but I have a whole bunch of questions, and sometimes the questions are extremely informative. Um, so um, I'd like uh, actually all the speakers to come up so that um, you can quickly feel the question. Um, so here's one for PG&E. Um, and I think it's a really important question. If I, have if I have received notice that my power is out, can I assume it's okay for me to cross a downed power line? Okay, do you understand the question? And? Is, is this one working? Can you hear me? Uh, no. Um, unfortunately, no. You, it, it's never safe to assume that you can cross a downed power line, even if you see lights out in the area, even if the, power, uh, the street lights are out. You should always treat a downed power line as if it's live, right? Which means give it a lot of clearance, make sure, you know, if it's in a puddle, you're not touching the puddle, etc. So the short answer is no. Even if you've been advised that your power might be out or is currently out, it's, it's never safe to touch or cross a downed power line, unfortunately. You want me to repeat the question when you're, yeah. That is a great question. She, she said, how many languages will these alerts be sent in? That is a great question. So yeah, people who, where English is a second language or don't speak it at all might have difficulties. Um, I'm, it's a little bit unfortunate, but at this point, English is the only language we have um, that we're working through with AC Alert. Uh, we recognize that as a deficit in the plan and the system. Um, some of that is, is resources. Other is um, we're trying to get the plans written um, in a fashion that we can then execute them and use them. And sometimes that, that capacity fills in after the fact. So it's a really excellent point. It's a known deficit in our plans um, and we hope to address it uh, as um, time permits. And obviously it's an important need that we have to fill. What is the status regarding eucalyptus removal in public hill lands? Public hill lands? What yeah. is the status of eucalyptus removal in public? Hill lands, hill which lands. I, I think means public, city of Berkeley public property and East Bay Regional Parks property. Well, I can't speak to Berkeley property, but I can speak to East Bay Regional Park District property. Um, if within an RTA, 
um, it, which is an identified recommended treatment area. It calls for the removal of eucalyptus. Um, very rarely does it call for re the removal of all eucalyptus, um, but if it's been identified as an area where the eucalyptus could cast embers and or are dead and standing trees and they need to be removed, um, they'll be removed as per the plan. Okay, great. Sorry. So he's asking about Berkeley. So they're yes, asking about Berkeley City property yeah. also. So uh, the parks um, and most open space in Berkeley property is managed by Parks, Recs, and Waterfront. Um, I've been working with the director on that. It's not just eucalyptus, it's also pines um, and other highly flammable, dangerous things. One of the, the projects I think um, Councilmember Weingraf asked about uh, with East Bay Parks is, is right along the area of Ajax um, and to the south to um, an area maybe a couple hundred yards down the way, they're taking out lots and lots and lots of dangerous trees. And there are a few that we identified when we walked through the area. Uh, Scott Ferris is the, the PRW director. And there's a particularly large overhanging pine that we're concerned about. So we're combining resources through the parks budget and the fire budget to pay to take that tree out. And um, beyond that, the forestry division has a regular maintenance plan for the parks. Um, I can't speak on behalf of a particular species like eucalyptus, um, so I'd have to check with the park director and the forestry division on exactly what that status is. But um, they, they follow their regular maintenance and, and it's again on our list to have a, a better, larger coordinated effort in conjunction with the work they do um, and make sure our parks and our public land that we're responsible for is consistent with best practices. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, for Jennifer, is ivy flammable? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> If you do cut it down and whack it, it'll come back. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Fire Chief Brannigan. Will the city designate areas to evacuate to, or is the evacuation destination up to each household? Yeah, that's a, uh, an interesting question because in the early minutes and hour of a fire like this, part of what we want to do with this evacuation plan is have the pre-plan some major routes. Um, the message may come through to just go. Go a general direction, um, get yourself to 80, get yourself north or south, uh, and that will evolve throughout the incident. Um, we, as a practice, try not to pre-designate a location before an incident. So here's the thing. If you live in a tsunami zone or in a hurricane area where you know where it's gonna come from, where you got it. It is the easiest thing to manage disasters on the East Coast because you get a warning, you know, a week ahead of time that you're about to, you know, get your city crushed. It's great. I wish we could work out there. But uh, this keeps us on our toes. And so earthquakes, wildfires, all of that, we have to wait until it happens to know what's going to be there and where we're going to send people. So what will likely happen is the initial message will be get out. And that's where your pre-planning is going to come in. Okay, I'm going to get out. These are my options. Here's what I see. There's smoke. I'm going the other way. Generally a good plan. And then, um, as we develop that, as we activate the city's EOC and our emergency managers get up online and we communicate with the school district, we communicate with our partners at UC, we might be able to say, there's an evacuation center at San Pablo Park. Gather at San Pablo Park, or maybe that's not good enough. Maybe it's down at the marina, or maybe it's Golden Gate Fields, or maybe it's nowhere in the East Bay. Um, and it's go to San Francisco. <laughs> And, and once we establish those connections with partners and we know where we can send people, we'll have more information to go out to the public. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. So um, there's three, I have three questions here that are very similar. Um, one is after the 1991 Oakland fire, the city of Berkeley arranged for self-inspections of all homes, followed by inspections by the fire department. Is the city planning to repeat? And I'll read the other ones because I think they can be answered together. Uh, what resources are there to get individual assessments and recommendations for homes to make them as safe as possible? And then the last one is, will the fire department come speak to neighborhood groups? So I think this all speaks to the, you know, 
very personal support that people are interested in knowing how they can get that. Yeah, so I'm gonna let pg &E answer. No. Um, so we have, uh, there was, after the 91 Hillfire, a special tax assessment that paid for um, extra funding, it paid for the shipper program, the debris bin program, and it paid for several inspectors who were dedicated to the hillside. Uh, I believe it was Prop 238, maybe, that passed that made that tax measure not possible, um, thanks to our proposition system. We lost that funding, those people were laid off. Um, we now have an annual inspection program, so we have a few fire inspectors. We have, we have three fire inspectors for the whole city for everything we do. Um, businesses, commercial, permits, wildfire, all that stuff. So what we do is we have our fire engines patrol and inspect all the properties um, from Grizzly Peak to Tilton Park is basically what it comes down to annually. So they drive by, they're allowed to view what they can from the street and give notices if there's uh, dangerous conditions that need to be corrected. Um, beyond that, uh, pretty much everything is complaint driven. So if you live between here and Grizzly Peak and you have a problem and your neighbors have a problem, uh, we absolutely encourage you to work it out with your neighbors, talk to them, see if there's some mutual assistance you can give each other to clear um, space. Uh, if it's really not something you can resolve, you can call 981 Fire. Uh, we'll then assign an engine company to come out and do that inspection. Um, and try to resolve it the same way. Um, and that's about it. We are happy to come out and do neighborhood groups. Same thing, call 981 Fire. Um, or three, if you can't remember that number, 311 is a general information uh, helpline for the city. Call 311, they'll connect you to us. We'll arrange for either a prevention inspector or a fire engine to come out and talk to your neighborhood group for you. This one's for pg &E. Can you talk about the haywire scenario and specifically how downed power lines will prevent evacuation and fire department to access? Uh, read it again, Mark. <laughs> the haywire Haywire, are you familiar with that? Okay. Are you? Okay. Okay, so Haywire is an earthquake scenario that the USGS, along with partners, just published phase two of a study that they did. Um, so it's not really in the context of what we're talking about today. Uh, earthquakes and pg &E lines certainly have um, some, I'm sure, conflicting uh, interests at times. Um, but I think in the context of wildfire, we're gonna keep it on that tonight. Um, there's all kinds of information on the web about Haywire. It's a great scenario. We're very happy it's released so we can all plan for that. Um, but it's a different context. All right. Um, so this is about vegetation management. How far can a cast ember still be live? Miles. 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 That would be the next question. Right, okay, thanks. <laughs> so there, is, there were rumors, and they're rumors because they haven't been proven, um, after the Oakland, after the tunnel fire, remember that was during a north wind event, um, which means, you know, blowing, the, the wind blowing, very hot, very dry, from Mount Diablo, off the shore across, that there were embers that were landing in San Francisco. Not proven, I can't speak to that. Um, it depends on the amber source. Um, pine needles usually don't last that long. Um, there are studies, I can't quote them, but somewhere between three and five miles. Um, some people say as far as seven. Okay, uh, so the next two questions uh, that I have here, and I think I might add a little spin of my own, basically go to the question of undergrounding. Um, so, you know, what about undergrounding wires <laughs> is one of them, and the other is, are the wooden electric poles themselves highly flammable? But I also wanted to just ask if you could um, maybe further elaborate um, on the distinction between um, what happens when you have an ignition from an electrical wire source versus what happens when a tree falls on the line and a, and a pole comes down versus
versus what happens when a pole burns. And I think people conflate all those into one thing, but if I understood correctly, um, those are slight, all, each one is a slightly different scenario. So if you could maybe drill down a little bit on what is really going on with poles, as well as talk about undergrounding and, and the benefits or, or costs. Right. So, um, so starting with undergrounding, um, pg e is investigating uh, a number of things about undergrounding, how to do it as cost effectively as possible, um, how to approach it uh, from a risk perspective, and, and the CPUC, our regulator, is doing the same. Um, the, the undergrounding um, gentleman earlier this evening mentioned Rule 20, which is the CPUC rule that guides and governs undergrounding projects and how utilities should go about addressing that. And that is an old rule that really uh, is, has nothing in it related to wildfire risk or things of that nature. So undergrounding has benefits, it has challenges, uh, it's costly to do, it's environmentally impactful to do, et cetera. Um, and so everyone, PG&E, CPUC, is revisiting how we should approach that and how we should think about undergrounding. Um, so it is certainly not a short-term solution at scale. It's not possible to underground a lot of stuff by October, right? Um, and so, but in the long term, as we think about how the system changes over the next five, 10, 20 years, um, undergrounding is potentially a part of that solution and we're working with our regulator to figure out how it fits. So more to come on, on undergrounding, but whenever it comes, as it were, um, it will not be an overnight fix. And that's why we need these other things to make sure that we can mitigate risks in the short term. Uh, wood poles, just like the previous comment, everything burns, wood poles burn. Um, we, uh, if a wildfire is coming towards our assets, we can pre-treat our poles with a fire retardant that's actually relatively effective. Um, and so we will do that in cases where a wildfire is coming towards our assets to help protect our assets. Um, but if the fire is hot enough or we're not able to do that, um, our poles will burn um, just like any kind of vegetation or, or major trees. And the last question was about uh, sort of different fire vectors related to electric assets. Um, so there are some things about electric assets that can create a spark on their own, right? It's not common, but transformers occasionally overheat, overload, and, and can explode, which could throw a spark one direction or another. That's one of the reasons the fire defense zone that we're trying to create is so important because on, we're, we're looking for 15 feet on either side of our uh, assets to create a relatively low fuel zone. So that if a spark were to start there, it would start a low, uh, grassy type fire that's easy to control, easy to put out, and wouldn't immediately you know, launch into something larger. Um, the, one of the biggest thing that, that we have to worry about is trees or limbs falling into our lines. Either if it touches two phases, that can create a spark or it can you know, ignite on its own, or it brings the wire down and then when the wire touches the ground, it uh, starts a fire. So there are a number of vectors that uh, a fire or an ignition risk exists related to our wires. Uh, and we're cognizant of all of them and we're doing things to mitigate each of those angles. Um, but what we have to do about each one in terms of keeping our equipment in good shape, uh, el eliminating trees falling into our wires and not getting things down, are, there's a few different things we have to tackle to try to mitigate those risks. And, and the public safety power shutoff program I talked about eliminates those risks if we have to turn that, uh, if we have to flip that switch. So we don't want to use it a lot, but temporarily, if the weather conditions uh, drive us to do that, we'll do that. We'll turn it off and then it eliminates all those vectors for as long as the power is, is turned off. Okay. okay, I'm going to field the next question because I've been very involved in this. What is being done to improve evacuation and fire truck access by dealing with parking choke points? Mm. Okay, this is a really big issue in my district in the hills. Um, and it's a very controversial topic because everybody wants the parking spot in front of their house, whether it's a choke point or not. Um, one of the 81 referrals that the fire department received <laughs> was to work with the public works department, because this is an interdepartmental issue, to identify those choke points and to red strike them. Now, 
I, I know people are not going to be happy, but we really have to think about the greater good. Um, so we're going to lose parking. Please, empty out your garages and park in your garages. And guess what? Your car won't be broken into. I'm glad you agree. Now all you have to do is go home and do it. <laughs> so, hopefully, in the remainder of my tenure, we will see those choke points opened up. The, the standard is 14 feet clearance, is that correct? Or is it 12? Bare minimum is 14 feet from, you know, edge to edge. And if you have a curve, you need even more because when the truck turns, it, it needs more than 14 feet. So um, we once had a map, many years ago, we had a planner in the fire department who made a map of all of the points in the hills that needed to be red zoned. <laughs> and um, it was pretty dramatic. <laughs> And uh, I tell you, you know, there's no way we, we can do that. But we, but we have to deal with the really, the really critical places. So um, uh, I think we're going to move forward with it. I think we have to. Okay. Next question. Okay. Will you communicate through AC Alert or through Nixle? Yes. We will communicate through both. Uh, in those cases, okay. we'll be sending both. AC Alert. Okay, and the last one, I think this is for Jennifer. Aren't bays and oaks sprouting louder fuels threatening the use? Are bays and oaks sprouting under a eucalyptus canopy louder fuel? Are bays and oaks sprouting louder fuels threatening the use? I don't, I don't think that they're a threat to the eucalyptus. Anything that can help a fire climb from low to high is ladder fuel. So I would say yes. But eucalyptus also throw down those those all that bark and all that stuff and give them a leg up. Yeah. So I don't I wouldn't blame it on the sap seedlings. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's it. I want a big round of applause for our panelists.